You know, every day I get a chance to see two very different worlds. See, in the daytime, I'm an attorney in one of the largest law firms in the world. Our offices are in one of the nicest parts of the city. We sit across from the Four Seasons Hotel, look outside our window, we overlook the Baltimore Harbor. We see ships coming in and out on a regular basis. We have a spectacular view of the city. But every day I leave that job, I go to my second job as a professional boxer. Now, some of you might be thinking LA boxing or some of these other clean, nice boxing gyms that have become popular in recent years with their saunas, steam rooms. Eliminate those thoughts. It's not what we're talking about. Think rocky, dirty, grimy gyms. You can smell the sweat, it doesn't smell good. <laughs> Generally in bad neighborhoods. See, anybody that understands and follows boxing knows the sport tends to take root in neighborhoods where people are struggling. They are literally fighting for a better life. Whenever I tell people that I'm a fighter and I'm a lawyer, some people think it's cool. But most look at me like I'm crazy. Why would I do that? The reality is that most people don't do boxing unless you have no other choice. But as a result of operating in those two worlds, I've become friends with people in both. So I get to hear their concerns, see their conditions, get to understand how some issues impact some, and simply they don't, others don't even think about it. See, every day I leave the nicest parts of town and go to some of the worst parts of town. And that gives perspective. See, as grateful as I am for my current living situation, and I absolutely am grateful, it's not too long ago that my lifestyle wasn't very much different than the guys that I'm boxing with. It's not too long ago that I was just a boy in the South Bronx, bad neighborhoods where gangs dominated. You know, I vividly remember once running with my father to, a, to, to go do something. We ran upstairs, parked the car, came back downstairs. By the time we came down, the car was stripped. I remember walking home with my brother and trying to look tough. So you try to dissuade confrontation. See, in those neighborhoods, you actually try to look mean to avoid conflict. I remember hearing about my friends getting beaten up. And as ironic as it sounds, since I'm here talking to you about being a boxer, I remember running to avoid getting beaten up. But I was given an opportunity to get out. I was given a chance to go to a boarding school in Watertown, Connecticut. See, before Taft approached me, I didn't even know that types of, these types of schools existed. That's not what we talked about in the South Bronx. I thought I was going to go to school with the same people I'd gone to school with. You know, I had just started becoming cool. Well, cooler. <laughs> they, just stopped, they just stopped making fun of me about my accent. Now they want to ship me off to a school in Watertown, Connecticut. And I didn't want to go. But my mother said, if you get in, you're going. So I got in, so I went. Taft completely opened my eyes, gave me a whole different perspective. It gave me new experiences. See, at Taft, not only was I in the racial minority, you know, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, we made up about six to eight percent of the population. But equally important to me was my realization very early that I was one of the low men on the socioeconomic totem pole. You know, I would talk to my friends and hear them talk about trips that they were taking. I would go to their house and see the lifestyles that they were living. And I realized very early, we are living two completely different lives. And at first it made me somewhat jealous, but it didn't make me bitter. What it did was it gave me something to aspire to. See, in the South Bronx, I had always thought I was gonna be rich. It wasn't until I went to Taft that I realized 
that what I was aspiring to was to be hood rich. For the, for the less cool of you, hood rich means you want the nice jewelry. <laughs> you want the nice car. It wasn't until I went to Tabs that I realized that rich people don't talk about these things. Or at least they don't talk about them as much as we talked about them in the South Bronx. It gave me something to aspire to, and that gave me perspective. But every break, every summer, I would go back to the South Bronx. I would go back to the bad neighborhoods. Yet to see very clearly the discrepancy and opportunities that are available for some. You get to see the contrast in, ex in what's expected of people who go to schools like Taft, who were fellow Moorheads with me here at Carolina, who work with me in my day job. The difference in their expectations and their lifestyles than the people who I grew up with in the South Bronx, who I box with every day. And that gives you perspective. See, that perspective was brought to a life for me this past year with the killings of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and the slew of other black men that were killed in publicized events. See, I could understand the frustration of many who thought this was just a continuation of discriminatory and disparate treatment against certain racial and socioeconomic groups. I knew what it felt like to have a police officer pull a gun on me. I knew what it was like to be in those bad neighborhoods. And because of my history, because of my, the diversity of my friends, I got an opportunity to see that debate unfold across both racial and socioeconomic lines. I found myself being very disappointed. A lot of the conversation happened over social media. And as many of you know, people just tend to say whatever they want to say on social media. And I found myself being disappointed, not because people had different views, but because they were talking past each other. And you had one set of people who had their views shaped by, their perspective shaped by their by their experiences, and they were talking, and they would spot off what they felt. And you had another group of people who had their, experience, their views based on their experiences, and they would say what they felt. But they were talking past each other. There was no intersection. Young moves the ball forward that way. And that made me realize our challenge. Our challenge is to force ourselves to be uncomfortable, to have these difficult conversations, to gain perspective. You see, the power of perspective was further highlighted to me after the Eric Garner situation because one of my best friends, I mean, this is my guy, a white guy from rural North Carolina, gave me a call and he said, you know, we have to do something. I didn't know what he meant. And after we started talking, he, you know, he said, he explained to me that it's not until he came to Carolina and interacted with me and some of our other diverse friends that he realized how wrong some of the things that he had heard growing up, how wrong they were. And that was surprising to me. It wasn't surprising because he had heard bad things about other races. I mean, if we're being serious, we all have. It was surprising to me because we were two very different people, and yet we were going on the same journey, just from different angles. We got to the same place. As a result of our interaction, our perspectives changed, and now you have a guy from rural North Carolina talking to me about a black guy being killed in New York. And that's powerful. And after having that and other difficult conversations, I came to realize that many people who were saying things that I didn't understand, they weren't being malicious. They simply didn't have that perspective. See, I had gained my perspective by my experiences as a black male operating in mostly white environments. I had gained my perspective from growing up and being friends with people in very poor neighborhoods while I'm living in the nicest parts of town. 
But that to me highlights our challenge. Our challenge is to be around people with different backgrounds who are different than us. Now, don't just mean people who look different than us. People with different upbringings, different cultures, different perspectives on the world. That's the only way we move the ball forward. If we're really going to have the discussion about race and class that have become so prevalent in our communities now, you have to force ourselves to have these difficult conversations. You have to force yourselves to be uncomfortable. You have to force yourself to have this perspective. Thank you.